Praise the Lord. The Lord give us the grace to be faithful in Jesus' name. We rise up as we pray together. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name for your word once again. We thank you because as your word is coming, it will cleanse us the more, empower us the more, energize us the more. Lord, we, make, we pray that you help us to show the faithfulness of Christ in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Bless us, Lord, and make us channels of blessing to people around us. And help us, Lord, that our ministry will edify the church. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're coming back to the epistle of Paul to the Romans. And today, we're coming to chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For this, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of his. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on a ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorts on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor, reject, detest that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible. As much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto us. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. 
If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul the Apostle had established the doctrinal part of the epistle. He had shown from the very beginning how we get connected to God. And he says, it's by faith. For the just shall live by faith. And then lest anyone will think, well, all right. We do not need that faith that brings us into relationship with God. Into reconciliation with God. That makes us to possess the righteousness of God. He then lays it line upon line, precept upon precept. And he says, the Jew is guilty in his faith for his sins to be forgiven, in his faith for him to come to the cross, to Calvary, and be reconciled unto God. That circumcision has not done that, will not do that, can never do that. And then he comes to the Gentiles. He says, the Gentiles, knowing God, they do not worship God as God. As a judge, as a creator, as a most high. In fact, they were so corrupt and abominable that the Lord gave them up. And then he emphasized that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then he begins to build up again. After everybody was knocked down by the revelation that we're all seen as Jew or Gentile, then he gave the mercy of God, the love of God, the compassion of God, and began to raise up again the people that were knocked down by the law of the Lord. And he says, by grace, by faith, we come in, into the kingdom. And he says, we even come to identify with Christ. We're crucified with him. And now we live. And the body of sin, that original sin, depravity, he said, is henceforth to not have dominion, authority over us because it's put to death. We're dead to sin, and sin is dead unto us. He talked about the struggling man, the one that will not come to Christ and will say, I'll try, I'll do my best. I'll give what it takes to be victorious. He said, no, you cannot. Until you come to the realization, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank Jesus my Lord. And then he brings us into the chapter filled with the presence of Christ. Filled with the power of Christ. And filled with the priesthood of Christ and then he brings us also in connection with the Holy Spirit and he shows us when the Holy Spirit is present and prevalent in our lives that he will lift us up he sets us free from the law of sin and death and then he digressed by inspiration he digressed to look at the remnant of the children of Israel. And after saying all that, that concerned Israel, it now comes publicly, it now comes to the whole church, it now comes to the brethren. And it says, now I beseech you therefore, therefore, from all that we have heard from chapter 1, therefore, by the grace made available, therefore, by the mercies, now yours and mine, therefore, because of Calvary, therefore, because of the price that Christ paid for redemption, it says, therefore, I beseech you, brethren, those who have become brethren, those who are sons and daughters in the kingdom of God, and those who are saints, children of God called to be saints, brethren, those who are in fellowship, present fellowship, 
Where's the Lord? He says, brethren, by the mercies of God, that now you present. You present. Gentiles, don't you ever think that because we have said circumcision is unnecessary, it's redundant, it's useless and worthless, that then, okay, since circumcision is of the body, that means now we're free. We can do anything with that body. He says, no. You're misunderstanding the point. The Jews presented less than one percent of their body in circumcision. But now, because you are bought with a price, and because you are now a child of God, because you are one of the brethren, you present now not one percent of your body, not your finger, not your toe, not only your ear, not only your eyes, not only your mouth, your whole body, you now present unto the Lord. And every action of that body, every movement of that body, every product of that body, everything that is done with that body is now to be done to the glory of God. And it talks about life as worship. It talks about everything you do. It says, you know, you know the mistake of those Jews, they limited worship to one day in the week, the Sabbath day. But now you present your body every minute, every moment, every day of the week, every week of the month, and you offer that in acceptable worship unto the Lord. And when you go to the world, the life you live in the world, in the marketplace, becomes a witness only for the Lord. Now, whatever you are doing in the world, wherever you find yourself in the world, you worship God, you witness for God. That's why it brings this practical chapter unto us. Believers, acceptable worship. And witness. We're dividing the chapter to three parts. Number one, a living sacrifice acceptable to God. A living sacrifice acceptable to God. Number two, a liberating service abounding in grace. A liberating service abounding in grace. Number three, the lovely selflessness, adorning godliness. The lovely selflessness, the life we now live. Lovely selflessness, adorning, beautifying godliness. We come to number one. In number one, a living sacrifice acceptable to God. Look at chapter 12. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mercies in the plural, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It tells us because we have received the grace of God by his mercy, by his love, by his compassion. It said, there must be a consequence to that. There must be a corollary because this that happened on the divine side. This must happen on the human side. Because this has happened at a point of time. At the point of salvation. At the point of conversion. Because that happened at a moment of time. Then for the rest of our lives, this must be what will follow. That's why it says, 
I beg of you. I plead with you. I beseech you. Therefore, because of those mercies of God, that now you will do something. Chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Reading from verse 13. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Every sin that is committed by anyone, anytime, in any dispensation, is by yielding one member or the other of the body unto unrighteousness unto sin. It might start from the mind, may get to the brain, may be planned, imagined by the brain, is transferred to the hand, or is the feet going somewhere they shouldn't go, or the ear hearing something we shouldn't hear, or the eyes looking at something, watching something, we shouldn't watch. Or the body interacting with flesh as we shouldn't. It says, therefore, now that we have received the mercy of God, and we have received the mercy of God in salvation, even in sanctification, even in consecration, even in crucifixion, even in total identification with Christ, says, neither yield your members, members of your body anymore as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves, your body, unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, every part of you and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, members of your body, servants to obey, the servants ye are, to whom ye obey, don't you know? If your hand is yielded into something, and you do it, and you do it, by repetition, it becomes a habit, difficult to break, don't you know? If your mind is set on something, and you think of it, and think of it, and think of it, then it takes over and becomes something habitual that you find difficult to break from. You become a servant, don't you know? If you always go to a particular place, you always walk to a particular place. You always move to a particular place. Your feet get used to that. It becomes a habit you find difficult to break. If you go to a site, and you're always checking up on that site, and the site on the internet will pollute your mind, will degrade your personality, and will ruin your Christian life, don't you know? If you keep on going and going and going, once you open your system, that's the first place you go. It becomes a habit. That's why it's sin. You become the servant of what you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And it tells us in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. You understand that he says, I am being detailed. I am going down to earth because of the limitation of your mind in understanding. That's what he's saying there. I speak after the manner of men. I use illustrations relating to men. I come down to earth and I break everything into details for you about this yielding because of the lack of understanding, because of the level of maturity, 
because of the infirmity of the flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so, now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. It says, reverse every action. Reverse the state of your mind. Reverse the thing that has become habitual. Reverse the way you think, the way you act, the things you do, the things you touch, the things you embrace, and the things you desire, and the things you appreciate. It says there must be a deliberate reversal. That as you yield, yielded yourself to sin in days gone by in the past. Now you reverse all that and you do the reverse of the negative. Why is he saying that? First Corinthians chapter 6. In First Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both each and them. Then he tells us now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by some power. He says, Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ, now you are born again. I'm talking to the Gentiles now. You used to take the body to the shrine and to those idols, and you did quite a lot of abominable things with those temple prostitutes. Now reverse that action, because shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Don't just resist and sit down there. Flee fornication. Don't allow things to go on in the flesh and in your mind, Lord, I don't accept this, but your body is doing it. Lord, this is not my plan, but your body is there. Lord, I promise you I'm going to dedicate everything I have, on, but, but your body is there. It says, don't stay there. Don't stand there. Don't wait there. Don't just stay there and have the heat of sin. Circulating your body. Don't just wait there and allow the mess in the world coming into your mind, coming into your brain, going through your nerves, and going through your feeling. Run. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication or adultery, sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Give it to God. Ye are not your own. Present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Ye are not your own. Take that body away from the sin partner. Ye are not your own. Take that body away from the adulterer. Ye are not your own. Take that body away from the adulteress. Ye are not your own. It says you cannot say, I will do whatever I will do because I belong to myself. It says, no, you don't belong to yourself. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? It says, ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. 
Glorify God in the activities of your hands, in the actions of the members of your body, in the words coming out of your mouth, in the sight that you look at, in the sounds that you hear, and everything you do with all the members of your body, it says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, because they now fully, totally, completely belong unto the Lord. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven. You see, before you became a Christian, there were some things that became part of your life, unchallenged, unexamined. You just assumed hand is hand, and hand will touch that, hand will embrace that. Hands will do that. And that became part of you. Legs are legs. Feet are feet. And feet will go there. The legs will walk there. Became part of you. Mind is, my mind is there. And there's a way you always think. And there are thoughts that will come to your mind. And when you see somebody you like, there's something that will come to your mind. When you see somebody you dislike, the things that will come to your mind. It became a habit. And those things that were there, unchallenged, unexamined. Is it right? Is it not right? And the Gentiles thought, everything we did in our body, our body belongs to us. And so he says, now, re-examine members of your body. And you are presenting that body unto the Lord. It says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb. I see her unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice. Have you examined that? It's, it's the situation of the mind. When that person, this is, you know, our life has been before we are converted. If that person looked at me and smiled, the mind will say, respond, smile. That's the mind. It's not just the face. It's not just a smile on your face. It's the mind. It's the level. It's something that was really registered there. And then you come in, and that person looked at you, and it was plastic. No expression. Your mind says, give it back to him. You too, you are plastic. Another person is coming and he frowns. Maybe something happened the previous day. He frowned. Maybe he heard some kind of information he didn't know how to handle. He frowned. Maybe it is like he's looking at you because of the things you the way you dress. And he frowns. And then your mind says, give it back to him. Frown at him. The frown. And we didn't examine all these things. And the Lord is now saying through the apostle, he's saying, tell them, reverse the response of the mind and the leaven of malice. And they think that to say, I'm a Christian, but the old leaven of malice is still there. And then we're acting, we're not acting on the basis of the fact that I'm a new creature. And I'm a new man. I have a new mind. I have a new heart. I have a change of heart. I am circumcised. We're not acting on our new personality. We're acting on the old leaven. Whatever we hear, the old leaven will rise to the top again. It says, now we must do something about this. Because we have received the mercy of God. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, a seer on leaven. For Christ, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread 
of sincerity and truth. This is what the Lord is telling us. And he tells us, present yourselves. Do it deliberately. Do it deliberately. When you are about to do something, stop. Is that habit? Is that the leaven of the old life? Is that the way I responded, reacted last year? Is that what I always said? Is that the register in my brain? Stop. Reverse that thing. When you reverse it, and reverse it, and reverse it, that also becomes a habit, a good habit, that now you are searching your mind, you are searching your action, you are searching your disposition in this new direction. It also becomes a good habit in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1, wherefore lay aside. You have to do something about it. The thing will not just leave you because now you are in a new place. You are in a new stage. You are in a new condition. Somebody has been thinking a particular way. Whenever you see something, you always think this way. What you see is connected with how you think. He's been doing that in his home country. Now he travels out. He's in either Europe or in America or in Asia. It's not in his own country anymore. And he sees something that he saw. The same thing that he saw in his home country. The mind will think as it used to think. The mind doesn't think of your change of location, of your change of country, of your change of place where you were. The mind thinks the same way. You were not married before. And any time anybody says this, this is how you react. This is how you respond. Now you are married. That you are married has not changed that, except you did deliberately. Your wife says exactly that thing that you heard before you were married. If you don't make a deliberate, deliberate effort, you act exactly the same way to your wife. Your husband does something that other people did before you were married. If you are not careful. If you don't make a deliberate effort, you will act exactly the same way to your husband like you used to act. The mind does not recognize the change of stage, the change of position, the change of locality. You are the one to give the information to your mind. Uh -uh. I'm not married. I cannot act like that to her. That's my mind. You know what? The name will call her we we'll call her wife. We we'll call her bride. Because of that, we cannot act the way we used to act. You only want to give information to your mind. My mind, you know what? This is not just an ordinary man. This is not a man like, you know, the other man I acted like this too. Whenever this happened, this one is called husband. And because this is called husband, I give information to my mind. I say, you cannot talk like that to him. You cannot act like that to him. You lay aside the things you used to do. In verse 1 of First Peter chapter 2, Wherefore lay aside all malice. Who do you hold malice with your wife? Or against your wife. Oh, because that's what the mind has always done from primary school days. Your friend did something you didn't like. And then what did you do? You stopped talking. You turned your face the other way. And you are silent, deadly silent. And it's the kind of silence that is louder than voice. And now from primary school, 
when we got to secondary school, somebody did something like that again. And what do you do? Stop talking to him. He's not qualified to be talked to. You can't interact with this one. There's a rascal. There's a rejected, worthless fellow. That's why you hold malice. It's not worthy. It's not worthy. You're too worthy. You're too high. And now you say you're a Christian. And somebody does exactly what they did in the primary school, secondary school. Give information to your mind. I tell your mind. You know what I'm called now? I'm called born again. I'm called Christian. I'm called sheep. I'm called sage. I'm called a citizen of the kingdom. And I'm no more a primary school pupil. I'm no more a secondary school student. Now I am crucified. Give information to your mind. And mind, we cannot react, we cannot respond like we used to. Lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. What did you do in the primary school? You had something about your teacher. You cannot wait till you get to school the following day. Then you call the other, student, the other pupil. Hey, I had something. Teacher did this. In his community ways, living teacher, did the, he was beaten up. Beaten up. But somebody was courageous. And then you spread the news around. You go to secondary school. And you're hearing some things about the principal. You're hearing some things about the prefect. You're hearing some things about the senior girl. What do you do? The same thing. The same thing. It's in the mind. And then, have you heard? Have you heard? Now, born again, you're in the church. And you heard something. Of course, you heard it. You're sure of what you have heard. About... Your leader. About your overseer. About another Christian. What do you do? The same thing you did in the primary school. The same thing you did in the secondary school. You have not given information to your mind. I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Lay aside all evil speaking. We don't say everything. We see. If we did that, we'll not do any other thing. We see quite a lot. We hear quite a lot. As newborn babes, verse 2, desire the sincere milk of the world, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Verse 9 of that same chapter 2. But she are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, living sacrifice acceptable to God. We present our bodies to him. The service will be acceptable in Jesus' name. God's people, in Jesus' name. Come back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. That is, when you are in the world, the habits that are built up, that took years, to demolish that habit, and not to be conformed to your old world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you'll prove what is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Point number two, a liberating service abounding in grace. A liberating service abounding in grace, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, 
to every man that's among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. It comes now to something privileged in human society. It comes to something that has been engraved, engraved, and written on the nature of man. From early childhood, we come into comparison. A little child has a toy. Another little child has a toy. And each one of them, unconsciously, they begin to make comparison. Not talking, not talking. Just looking at that toy and looking at this toy, all of a sudden, the child starts crying. Why? A thought comes to the mind. My toy is not as good as his toy. Nobody said that. That's his own imagination. That's his own evolution. All of a sudden, the other boy, the other child starts laughing. Why? I have a better toy. A bigger toy. A more beautiful toy. It starts from childhood. And then as we're growing up, we see another child in our village. Which school do you go to? I go to St. whatever. How about you? Which school do you go to? I go to, mentions the name of the school. Immediately, he feels inferior. Immediately, nobody talking to him. Nobody telling him anything. There is constant evaluation. And then we become Christians. At the day we became Christians, we were just so happy. The joy of salvation. The glory of salvation. We didn't think about anything. We just thank the Lord and born again. All of a sudden, we become workers. Rendering service in the house of God. All of a sudden, this ugly thing will come back again. I'm more useful than you are. I'm more important than you are. My ministry is more essential, more central than yours. If I'm not there, there's nothing you will do. And then the other one too, feeling like that. Look at him there. Look at her there. And because of all that, evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. And Paul the Apostle said, you know what? We have been wrongly directed from our youth by this evaluation. You see a doctor, you see an engineer, you see a tailor, you see a cook, you see a dry cleaner, you see a sweeper, you see a messenger, you see a porter, you compare. But do you understand? Without the work of the tailor, how do you go out into the car? Without the engineer, how do you go to move and get to see the doctor? Without your cook, how do you get alive, stay alive, even though the doctor is the best doctor in town? But you don't have somebody to cook for you, and there's no food. And without the sweeper to keep everything clean and hygienic, how do you live a life that is sound and healthy? Everyone is important to the other. And Paul the Apostle is saying that all these things were carried from our old life, 
comparison, comparison, comparison. I'm better than you are. Or you are better than I am. Because I feel you are better than I am, I feel inferior. I feel dejected. And the things God has given me, I cannot do because I have a wrong slant, a wrong imagination, a wrong evaluation. And I cannot, with a sincere mind, with a sincere heart, do what I do for the Lord. Therefore, he says, I'm saying, through the grace given unto me, to every man who has felt so important, to every woman who has felt unimportant, I say to every minister that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly, soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. What does that mean? It's comparing now the body of Christ, and it's comparing the services were rendered. It's comparing that to members of the body. Somebody says, you know, I'm a runner. I'm an athlete. And I run. And I need my legs so much. Which, until you have bad eyesight, the legs will perform less. I'm developing my feet. Wait. That you have hearing impairment. That you don't hear very well. Then you understand how important the ears are. Even to the legs assisting. My legs are strong. I run fast. Wait. Until your arms have disease. Painful and you cannot move the arms as regularly, synchronizing with the movement of the legs. Every part of the body is important to every other part of the body. Because it says so, we be many. A one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. Having then gifts. Differing according to the grace that is given to us. It's not talking about the service we render. It must abound in grace. Do the best. Pass the baton on. Let the person you are passing the baton to do the best. Do your best and pass it on to other people. Let the person you are passing the baton to, let him, let her do her best. That's how there will be progress in the body of Christ. Have been then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. We're not trying to outshine anyone. You'll not want your engineer to outshine your doctor. You don't want your doctor to outshine your cleaner. You don't want your teacher to outshine your cook. You don't want competition between the people that are serving you. And you don't want anyone serving to feel so inferior. I'm not needed. Why should I be there? So and so is there. Such and such is there, such and such is there. No. You appreciate everyone, and then your own service to you. The people that ministered before you, you appreciate. And those who are going to minister after you, 
you appreciate. And as we are in the body of Christ, we're not downgrading, belittling the ministry of the women. We're not looking down on the ministry of the youths. We're not speaking in a derogatory manner or acting in a way to tell them indirectly, children ministry, what's that? What did they do there? Neither are we looking at the campus as if, I hear you, so you think you're a ministry? No. Every section, there is no one that is trying to say we are the most important, you are important, but not the most important. You are as important as he is. You are important as she is. That's what the Lord is telling us here. And in verse 7 of ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Improve on your ministry. Improve on your delivery. Improve on your usefulness. Be an encouragement to the other person too to improve on their ministry, on their contribution. He that exhorteth, he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Isn't that what's important in our ministries? Whatever we're doing, I want you now to bring yourself into the picture. Pose for a picture. And look at yourself. Don't look at other people now. At yourself. You have gift. What's that gift? Identify that gift. According to the grace that is given to you. What's that? Look at that grace. You do it easily. You do it joyfully. You do it happily. You do it without effort. Let that always be there. According to the proportion of faith, you do it believing God has called me. Don't run down yourself. God has raised me up. Don't run down yourself. Don't say, you know, you're under yourself because you're comparing. You don't compare with any other person. He is also looking at his own gift. He's looking at the grace. He's looking at the faith that God has given him. And then, verse 7, wait on your ministry. Wait on your ministry. Develop that ministry. Sharpen that iron. Improve that method. And the things you do, concentrating on yourself. And then teaching. Teaching. Let your ministry teach. Let your ministry teach honesty, faithfulness. Let your ministry, the way you do your ministry, the way you carry out your ministry, let the people know my ministry is different from his. Her ministry is different from mine. But the way she carries out her ministry, she is teaching me devotion, dedication, honesty, thoroughness. Let your ministry teach. Let it exhort without saying a word. The way you carry yourself, the way you comport yourself, and you're not even aiming at this. It's just that the best is good enough for God. And because the best is good enough for God, you just demonstrate that diligence, that honesty, that devotion, that determination, that sincerity, and that single-mindedness. He that giveth with simplicity. Don't come with an air of pride. You're giving not just money. You give money. Yes, we do. You give your service. Yes, we do. You give your own contribution to the growth of the church, the body of Christ. Yes, we do. 
And you give your own approval by just sitting down. Sitting down. Because if you're not sitting down there, who will the choir be singing to? You have to sit down there. And with your sitting down there, and the posture with which you sit down, you're an encouragement. You're telling them, I appreciate your ministry. Give more of that to me. And with everything that you do, you are showing that you are simple-hearted. You are not proud. You are not comparing yourself with other people. You are not criticizing when something is being done. You are simple. And then, in the true let with diligence, whatever the area of your ministry, you are diligent about it. You are there when you ought to be there. You're doing it when you ought to be doing it. You are sacrificing your time, sacrificing your talent, sacrificing everything you have whenever you have to minister. You're not giving less than God has bestowed when you minister. You're not reserving your energy for another sin which has not come yet. Here I am, at this point, I'm supposed to offer my service. I'm not trying to minimize. I'm not trying to diminish. I'm not trying to take away from everything I should give at this time because I'm thinking of what I will give later. Give your best at the time you have the opportunity to diligence. And then cheerfulness. Whatever it is you're doing, you're cheerful about it. It's not like, here I come, what can I do? I have to do this. Here I come, left to me. I shouldn't be doing this. But because the pressure is there, the calling is there, and the challenge is there, all eyes are at me. If I don't do this now, okay, let me go there. You're not cheerful. You're not happy. You're not excited. You're not saying, what an opportunity. I'm serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm going to give it everything I've got. It says, calm. The platform is set. The stage is set. You are the man, you are the woman of the hour. The people of God are waiting for you. Heaven has something to pass across to the children of God, to make the children of God stronger, happier, more righteous, more holy in the sight of the Lord. And you are the one we are waiting for. Come and give it to us. You are simple-hearted, you are humble, but you are cheerful and happy. What a privilege the Lord has given me. I pray that this understanding the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Somebody there would say a good amen. amen. Point number three, the lovely selflessness adorning godliness. Look at this. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. It goes back again to how we used to act. That he has done something to mommy, we didn't really appreciate in our hearts. We don't like daddy. How could he talk to that, like that to mommy? When we were very young, and when we depended on the father for everything. And now, we need to go back to school. We're still not seeing that in our hearts that daddy did to mommy. It's not right. It's not right. But I'm, I'm going to him for school fees. So there's not the time to show any bad face. Because daddy will say, what are you thinking about? What's happening to you? Why are you funny like that? And so, we we'll pretend. We're nice daddy. 
I'll be going back to school. Or smile, for the heart is saying, bad man. <laughs> bad father. Daddy, my school fees is this. And then pocket money. And then we'll get it. If you're a girl, you kneel down. If you are a boy, tell me, you're prostrate. And daddy is deceived. Because you wanted to get something. And then we now come to the Christian life. And in the Christian life, we always want to get something. Always want to get something. Can you just take vacation from getting something and say, I've had enough. The love of God, I've had enough. The grace of God, I've had enough. The mercy of God, I've had, I've had enough. The opportunity I have in Christ, I've had enough. I'm not asking for anything now. I just love God and love the people of God sincerely without dissimulation. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. When he says, abhor that which is evil, most of us do. Probably all of us do. But we do it when we see evil in the other person. It happens in the home. The husband never sees his own fault. The wife never sees her own fault. If we see any evil at all, I see evil on her. If she sees any evil at all, she sees evil in me, in my action. If we see any evil at all, we see it on the other person. It says, turn the light inward. And for, for this moment, and for this day, and for your life, leave the other person to his God and turn the light inward upon that which is evil, evil in your talk. That way I spoke to her. Is that right? That way I imposed myself on him as if I am the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And I don't even appreciate his peace of mind, his joy, his love. He wants to live. He wants to be happy. Am I the only one that wants to be happy? Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Many times we act not because that person is good or bad. We act because there's something troubling our mind. I want to spill it over to every other person. But this year, can we just be kindly affection? However you feel, whatever you're going through, whatever mountain you are climbing, Whatever challenge you may see, just understand this year as I interact with people to demonstrate my own state of mind and my own Christian experience, I'll act in brotherly love to everyone in honor, preferring one another. In honor, I want it, he wants it. You can take it first. I want to go through the door. She wants to go through the door after your sister. She wants to have a cup of water. I want to have a cup of water very badly, seriously. I'll take after you. There's an opportunity, only one opportunity, and two of us are lining up. My brother, go ahead. No, you are better than I. You have been preaching before I started, before I even got converted. My brother, I said, please go ahead. In honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Whatever we're given to do, we just do it with all our strength. You know, sometimes when we're preaching, 
We're not, we're not doing it mistakenly. We do it because we're led to. And we might mention the marriage committee. Understand, we're not talking about you. You've been giving your best, but you know, in a large church like this, there's a marriage committee, there's a marriage committee, there's a marriage committee, there's a marriage committee almost everywhere. And there may be one or two out of 100. There may be one or two out of 500 marriage committees in the land. That the Lord wants to correct something. And in your own case, by the grace of God, you're all right. And the Lord appreciates what you're doing. And the preacher comes here and he says, now the marriage committees, look at this and look at that. And then your hands are down. I've done my best, of course. I've lived a good life, of course. I brought all sincerity, all the good things I know, into that stuff. Of course, of course. But there's somebody there that the Lord wants to send the word to. And then you take that so personally, and then you go back, and then you are not your best anymore. Because whatever we do, look at what they always say. Are we always talking to you? Understand. Serve the Lord. Be fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Your joy will increase. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. As you see some things you need to improve in your life. You need to improve in your ministry. You continue instantly in prayer. The Lord will help you. Distributing to the necessity of saints. You know, as we talk about distributing to the necessities of the saints. You're a saint. You must have something to contribute. Look at that widow that came. The rich people were offering. The wealthy people were offering. And then she came and she offered how much? Tell me out if you know the Bible. Tell me out loud. If you are not afraid, you'll be wrong. Tell me what she offered. Two miles. I knew you knew it. And it says that this woman has offered more than them all because out of her penury, poverty, she's given everything, she's God. Contribute your part. Distribute to the necessities of the saints. Don't say it's too small. Bring it. Don't say, what will this achieve? Bring it. Don't say, how far will this go? Bring it. God knows who you are. And he knows what you have. He knows your limitation. Giving to hospitality. Hospitality is not just what you give. It's the attitude. The excitement. The joyfulness which would you give. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and cost not. We'll do it in Jesus' name. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Somebody has got a child. And I'm still looking. I'm still praying. I'm still waiting for my own miracle baby. Go ahead and rejoice. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. That person had accident. Accident? This new year, a believer, a child of God, me, by the grace of God, nothing can touch me. Stop all that. Weep with them that do weep. When you go there, empathize, sympathize, and Get under their skin. How they feel. Feel it with them. Be of the same mind one to another. Be considerate. Might not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Not to always be visiting the rich. Visiting the high. Visiting the people up there. Until we make the people that have less as if they're not appreciated as members of the church. We give more attention. We give all the attention to the people up there. It says, condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. 
recompense to no man. Tell me. Tell me out loud. The nature of man. The nature of man. Even as bad as things became for Adam. Adam was in the garden of Eden. He was there first. And now the Lord created Eve. It's not good for him to be alone. And so Eve came along as the wife. And the serpent came to Eve and said, as God said, no, God has not said that. He has said only this we must not, not even touch. That's where that ah, you will not die. And then she ate of the forbidden fruit. And gave to her husband, and he ate of the forbidden fruit. Adam, where are you? Adam, what have you done? Who told you? That you are naked. Have you eaten of that fruit? The wife that you gave me. She gave me of the fruit and I ate. Eve, what have you done? The serpent deceived, beguiled me and I ate. How many of them, or which of them, was driven out of the garden of Eden? Tell me out loud. Both, both of them. And Adam, even though he had fallen, Adam did not revenge and take that on Eve. Eve, you see what you've done? You see what you brought me to? Look at that garden far away. We cannot get to that garden now. You see what you've done? Don't you ever talk again to me when I make decisions. Now we are out here. Only that God created only one woman. Why it not for that? Doctrine or no doctrine? Teaching or no teaching? You're fortunate. That God created only one woman. Otherwise, tell me. Adam did not do like that. Can we this year forget past injuries? Can we this year stop all that language? See what you've done. See what you brought me to. See where I am now. And see what our people in the village, see what they're saying about me because of you in my life. And see what the other people, all the honor, all the glory I built up. And every good thing I had before, you're coming in. Look at what you have done. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't take the punishment of others, of your husband, of your wife, into your hand. Of our brethren, into your hand. Be cheerful, be loving, give, be hospitable, be nice. Therefore now, if thine enemy hunger, tell me, feeding. And then it says, if he thirst, tell me, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of conviction fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with overcome evil with from now on, in life, some things will happen that your mind will not approve of, that your knowledge will not approve of, that your style of life will not approve of. 
That's the evil thing to you. And as you move on in life, research your mind. Research your response. Research your reaction. An evil thing has come. That thing will not overshadow my love. Will not overshadow my compassion. Will not overshadow the normal reaction a new creature ought to have. I will overcome that evil thing. I'm always going to be a Christian. Always going to be a conqueror. Always going to be a champion. Always going to be like Christ. That grace is passed on to you. Go through life and go and reflect Christ in your world. Let the Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. Rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Make it real in my life.